been uh, introducing. Um, sorry, I can't be there in person. Um, I've, I think I could spend my life doing public talks in the moment. Um, so for interest of family life, I thought it'd be better to zoom into you. So hopefully that's okay with uh, you folks. Um, and I promise to head north at some point soon and uh, give you a talk in person. Um, so uh, tonight, <coughs> excuse me, um, I thought uh, I would do a bit of a shameless um, promotion and talk about uh, our new book, uh, which is uh, a product of the Northern Picts project and the Cabarrito Kingship project uh, at the University of Aberdeen. Um, and uh, I'll show you some familiar material uh, tonight, I would imagine, for many of you. Um, but I'll also talk about some new sites and some new progress, particularly at uh, Burkhead. Um, but I thought I'd also give you a kind of overview of what's, what's in the book. I'm sure you've all got a copy now. If you don't, it's available in good, all good bookstores for a re very reasonable price. Um, and uh, yes, just to give you an overview of what's, uh, what's new in the book, I guess. Um, so I think uh, our, our, our book is the first large-scale academic study really since uh, the 1960s, since uh, Isabel Henderson's book on, on the PICS. Um, and it's one that combines archaeological uh, evidence, uh, building on all the discoveries that have been happening over the last 20 years or so, uh, but also underpinned by Nicholas Evans' historical research, uh, which is fantastic to have as part, part of the project. So really a kind of twin-pronged attack, you know, giving you an overview of what we know from uh, the limited historical sources we have and from the archaeology as well. And really, the picks have this kind of enduring fascination, I think, and this enduring mystery as well. So this is a, um, a 12th century Norwegian source talking about the, the petty, the, the, the picks, uh, and how they were only a little taller than pygmies, and they accomplished miraculous achievements by building towns morning and evening. But in midday, every ounce of strength deserted them, and they hid in fear in underground chambers. So you can see already by the 12th century, so only a couple of centuries after the kind of last um, historical reference to the Picts, that people are making mythologies about the Picts. They're making making up stories and myths about these people who had apparently um, disappeared. Um, and really, that's been the kind of historian's view ever since. You know, the problem of the Picts in the 1950s, the Wayne, the Wainwright volume, uh, and more recently, people like Chris Wickham, the great um uh english historian uh who has written lots on kind of comparative early medieval studies across europe um still in 2009 saying a kingdom that sometimes operated on a larger scale the picks remain amazingly obscure even by british standards um so really um it's a, a perception that's that's a fair one to an extent in terms of we do have very limited historical sources. So if we compare that to Anglo-Saxon England or the medieval Ireland, then we really are quite bereft of, of sources. And these are very much limited um, to external sources. So Athavan's uh, Life of Columba, for example, um, Bede's uh, History of the English uh, uh, People, uh, and also Irish sources, uh, which, which tend to be one-liners. So talking about the death of a king or a battle uh, happening in Pickland, but very much kind of, you know, the tweaks of their day, you know, very limited information from those sources. Uh, and then we have uh, other sources that can help us, things like uh, uh, inscriptions, uh, both in uh, Ogham or Ohm, um, Irish derived script, um, very occasional Latin inscriptions, and also information like place names that which we can um, 
uh, work quiz that gives them a broad idea where where the picks uh, occupy. But even the place names themselves are are filtered through a later lens. So often, for example, the pet names twinned with uh, Gallic um, uh, uh, place name elements. Um, so in terms of, you know, our first uh, reference to the picts is, is, is a Roman one. Uh, it's in a panegyric for Constan, uh, Constantius uh, Caesar uh, and written uh, somewhere around AD 297 or 298. Um, and throughout the Roman period, in this kind of late Roman period, the picts are um, a noted enemy uh, of Rome. And we can see that uh, with uh, the Roman Empire being on the doorstep of uh, the, the tribes of, of Northern Britain, and laterally the Caledonians and Maatai, and then the, the Picts, we can um, guess, I think, from the uh, written sources that there's some sort of political consolidation of identities and power in the North uh, as the Roman period progresses. So if we look at the early Roman sources, we see lots of different identities, tribal groups or communities, uh, whatever we want to call them. Um, by the early third century, that's uh, reduced to a couple of different groups, the Caledonians and Maatai. And then really in the fourth century, it's the, the Picts that come to the fore um, as this uh, enemy of Rome uh, and these troublesome groups that live uh, north north of the frontier. Um, so this is something that we can garner from uh, the Roman sources. Um, but if we look at the kind of more uh, uh, recent uh, histories, then this kind of late Roman flourishing of the Pictish identity has very much been downplayed. So people like Alex Wolfe and James Fraser uh, arguing that there was no real Pictish identity until the 7th century uh, with the Battle of Necton Smear uh, and the reimagination of a classical term to give this group um, a name, uh, the Picts, the, the, the painted uh, people. Um, but in the book, we take quite a different view. Um, and one, I think, is... Uh, more akin to some of the earlier scholarship, I think, in terms of um, Nick Evans has done a great job looking through all the early references to the Picts and how those references relate to how other groups are referred to in the kind of late antique worlds, the late Roman Iron Age, early, early earliest, early medieval period, fifth, sixth century. Uh, and what he found was that the Picts are very much um, couched in the same terms as we, as we find for other groups like the Scots or the Saxons or Irish uh, groups. So they do seem to be uh, a particular ethnic identity um, and they seem to be a very prominent one, certainly in the late Roman sources. Um, so we very much take the view that the Picts are uh, an important force. They are some sort of identity uh, undoubtedly changing through time. Um, but one that very much emerges in this late Roman uh, Iron Age. And this is also prompted by our, our new archaeological work, which is also painting a picture of continuity from that late Roman Iron Age through to the early medieval period. So we think it's likely that that Pictish identity did become an identity that the people who lived in Pictland would have recognized and perhaps uh, indeed called themselves by that name uh, too, which in its an initial guise is a Roman nickname, the, the painted people. It's painting them as barbarians who tattooed themselves or colored their skin perhaps. So it's a very much an othering identity, but one that seems to be adopted at least by the neighbors of the Picts in that late Roman and early medieval uh, context. So what about the archaeology? Um, well, if we go back to this famous volume of the Picts, The Problem of the Picts by, by Wainwright, which was the first book that I looked at when I was beginning to study the Picts, and one of the few that was really still 
is circulation. Um, that's been one of the big problems about the picks is how little there has been written in a very thorough uh, academic manner. Lots of wild speculation about the symbols, but other than that, very little on the archaeology and early history. So what did Wainwright say about the archaeology? Uh, well, in this volume, uh, it says there's no Pictish problem in archaeology because archaeology knows nothing of the Picts, um, which was a real call to arms, I think, when we were beginning in the project. You know, what on earth can we find out about the Picts through, through archaeology? Um, and that led to the establishment of the Northern Picts project at the university uh, in 2012. Um, which was set up by grants to uh, our development trust, which is our kind of charity charitable body. So someone has very kindly um, gave us significant amounts of funding to, to launch a project of this nature. Uh, and then laterally, the Leverhulme Trust has been funding the, the, the project as well. Um, and just to give you an idea of the kind of challenges we are facing and hopefully the progress that we've made, uh, this is a map that I made recently um for the project um looking at what we knew prior to the year 2000 say about pictish archaeology and so this is a map of northeast scotland showing uh, all the symbol stones in blue and then the archaeological sites we knew of uh, pre-2000 probably pre-2010 to be honest um and you can see there was uh, a mighty eight sites uh, which included a few uh, fairly poorly dated forts, uh, places like Burghead, um, Cully Can, uh, and a few possible cemeteries uh, like Tilly um, and Denotter, which was a, a site referenced, uh, but not excavated. Uh, and then this is what we know today, um, a much more populated landscape. Uh, largely through the work of Northern Picks, but also other contributions, um, showing uh, a plethora of um, cemetery sites, uh, fortified settlements, um, lowlands uh, enclosure sites, uh, and a whole series of um, church sites as well. So it's thankfully beginning to become a much more fleshed out picture. That's not to say that we still have huge progress to make. Um, so if we compare this to Anglo-Saxon England, where they have thousands of settlements known, uh, thousands of burial sites, uh, or early medieval Ireland, where we have 40,000 ring forts um, known and hundreds of those excavated and dated, then you know we're still looking at handfuls of sites in, in Pickland, but we have to start somewhere. So. Hopefully that's that's beginning to set good foundations for uh, progress. <clears throat> so um, what's in the book? Well, you're going to have to buy yourself a copy and, and have a read. Um, and I can't cover everything tonight. So um, in the book, there's chapters on uh, settlement. Uh, so the settlement evidence is slowly beginning to, to emerge um, from upland uh, settlement sites. Uh, such as the Pitcarmot Pit dwellings, uh, to all the sites that we have in the Northern Isles. And this is, I think, again, the first time that we really try to integrate that kind of Atlantic Scottish evidence uh, or Pictish evidence with what we have uh, in the East and uh, in the Highlands. Uh, there's chapters on the early church, um, warriors and warrior culture, uh, funerary rituals uh, and the symbols. Um, so tonight I thought I'd just give you a couple of uh, updates on where we are with um, uh, a couple of major sites and then end uh, with a uh, kind of brief discussion of what we know about the picture symbols and some of the progress we've made there. So some of this will be a review, but hopefully there'll be some new information. Uh, so let's look at um, the kind of elite centres and the kind of progress we've made there over the last uh, decade or so. So if we were going back to that uh, volume of Wainwright and the kind of scholarship in the 1970s and 80s, then it was Hillforts that really was one of the few categories of evidence that you could actually grasp uh, and say, well, this is likely to be Pictish in date, and we have a few sites that are historically referenced. 
but as you can see in the map here, you know, our um, references were very few in Picklands. So Picklands marked in blue here. And you can see there are sites mentioned in the 7th century, in the 9th century, in central Scotland, a few possible sites in the 7th century, in the Great Glen, um, but very limited. Um, and now we can see from the red dots, these are sites identified from archaeological evidence. And again, you can see it's still not a hugely populous map, um, but it's beginning to flesh out, including into areas that we don't have those historical sources. Uh, most most import importantly. Uh, and what we can also see is that uh, some of these sites uh, have a much earlier origin than we suspected, extending back into the Roman Iron Age. Um, so again, um, creating clearer linkages, I think, between late Roman Iron Age and what happens afterwards in a post-Roman context. And we can also see that some of these landscapes are way more complicated and way more complex than we ever um, uh, gave credence to. So let's look at Rhiney. Um, this is the kind of site that really uh, kick-started the project. Um, and here in this landscape, we've got the lowland complex at Rhiney, um, round about the Cross Dane. Uh, we've got Tappan Off to the north, uh, which I'll come on to. Uh, and we've got Cairn Moor, which is a, a small, but quite significant, Ring fort just in the south side uh, of uh, the, the Strathbogie Valley. Um, and I say this is what set the project off. Um, so uh, in 1978, uh, this, this chap here in the centre, Kevin Austin and his father, uh, were ploughing the land at Rhiney and they hit this stone uh, in the field uh, just down slope from the cross stain. Uh, and lo and behold, this was the the the, the so-called Rhiney man. So why on earth was this figure carved on the stone, and what was he doing standing uh, or now lying in this field uh, all these years uh, later? Um, so our reason for interest in this landscape was because of the number of symbol stones, and our project was really trying to understand more about the context of these enigmatic monuments. Um, so what on earth were all these examples doing in the Rhiney landscape and what could we tell about uh, the site? Uh, so they included the cross stain standing in, in situ, a warrior carving, the Rhiney man, and some more of these kind of classic symbol stones with the paired symbols uh, on them. Uh, and then from the, the place name, we knew there was something significant here. So it means a place associated with a great or a sacred uh, King. Um, and what's really interesting, again, this is uh, Nick Evans' work, is if you look at the early maps of the region, you can see that that pl place name is actually associated with the area uh, where we conducted our excavations from 2011 to 2017. So you can see the Kirk of Rhiney here, um, but the actual place name Rhiney is just to the south, uh, opposite Barflat Farm. And it's in uh, and the cross thing uh, still stands today. And when the Rhiney man was found, um, crop marks uh, recorded by Ian Shepherd uh, and laterally Ian Ralston showed this really complex uh, settlement. Uh, and that's what we excavated uh, in the early stages of the project. Um, and not in our wildest dreams did we imagine this would be located here. So a, a very complex settlement, which we stripped and mapped over five seasons of excavation, revealing uh, buildings inside uh, and these monuments standing at the entranceway to this elaborate uh, palisaded enclosure as it was uh, in its later stages. And then the cemetery um, we located near the village uh, contemporary, including with uh, one burial with human remains. And this is where the warrior carving came from, um, seemingly associated with a burial monument uh, when it was found in the 19th century. Uh, and then in terms of the status, we were able to uh, establish that, that through the types of materials that these people had, had thrown away. Uh, so we had uh, late Roman amphora um, coming from the Eastern Mediterranean, glass from Western France and from, uh, from England, 
um, and a whole range of uh, high dress, high status dress accessories. And then part of the reason in the wealth of the settlement was undoubtedly it was a, a place of production. Uh, so we've got refining vessels, uh, metalworking tools, ingot molds, hundreds of crucible shares, hundreds of mold fragments, all from a site that's been quite severely plow truncated. Uh, so we're dealing with a site that's, you know, uh, quite badly damaged, and we only excavate about 10% uh, of the deposits. So it just gives you an idea of what was there uh, in the Pictish period. Uh, and these are the kind of things that we're making. Uh, big, fancy, penanular brooches of the kind you find in the Norris Law and the Gold Cross hordes. Um, hand pins, again, from uh, those, those horde sites. Uh, and also the kind of objects that resemble what you see in the symbol stones. So there's a whole series of these animal uh, figurine molds, uh, including hounds, as you can see here, uh, wild boar, uh, and what might be stags as well. So they're animals of the hunt. It's the kind of imagery you begin to see on the later picture stones, the, the cross slabs. Um, but, you know, seemingly this had an earlier origin, and you can see that in the iconography uh, of Rhiney and of likely contemporary stones. <laughs> and then clearly there was a, a sacral dimension to power at Rhiney. So we've got uh, this axe that the Rhiney man carries, which is similar to the Sutton Hu axe, which might be for sacrificing cattle um, and objects that are perhaps uh, uh, sacral in nature as well. And then we have the kind of warrior dimension to the Rhine as well, both in terms of the imagery. So uh, one of only three or four warrior images we find in Eastern Scotland comes from Rhine. Uh, they were producing weaponry on site. So there's uh, a lovely um, CX blade uh, and there's a sword pommel that's, that's unfinished. They're clearly making uh, weapons on site. And the little animal figurines might also be helmet attachments as well. So you've got this kind of developing warrior ethos um, indicated by the finds. Uh, and then what's particularly interesting <laughs> about the dates is this um, origin of the site is, is in that late Roman period. So it begins in the fourth century in exactly the time period that the Picts are first mentioned uh, in these Roman sources and clearly becoming this more powerful uh, group who were involved in things like the Barbarian Conspiracy in AD 367, when the Picts collude with the Saxons uh, and uh, the Irish and the Scots, uh, and they raid uh, the Roman Empire and bring it to its knees for a couple of years. And you can see the start date for Rhiney actually is in that uh, generation in which that uh, Barbarian Conspiracy takes place. So we were quite pleased with uh, our findings at Rhiney, um, but we didn't really realize we were just at the tip of the iceberg <laughs> in terms of what was going on in this landscape. Um, so this is the results of more recent work, uh, some of which you'll probably uh, be aware of, but we were back um, last summer doing more work at uh, Tappan Off, and we'll be there this year as well. Uh, and what we're looking at uh, in particular is the lower fort at Tappan Off. So on, on top, we've got this uh, vitrified fort dating to 400 to 200 BC, so well before the Pictish period. But this later uh, fort, as we found out here, the lower fort here, um, was a big surprise. It was always assumed to be late Bronze Age or even middle Bronze Age when the climate was better and you might want to live on these crazy, crazy hills. Uh, and then we did some LIDAR uh, imaging and um, photogrammetry. Uh, That's the work of uh, James O'Driscoll, who works on the project, showing that there were hundreds, probably about 800 um, pla uh, house platforms on the hill enclosed by that lower, lower rampart. Um, and it was 2019 before we began to investigate the site, showing the rampart uh, was a very substantial feature with a huge palisade. Uh, which if that palisade runs around the whole hill, is about one and a half kilometers of palisade. So think of the investment and resources uh, in this site. Uh, and then every house platform that we've excavated on has indeed turned out to be a house or a series of houses or 
huts or whatever you want to call them. Uh, so uh, from the earliest excavations here, 2019, we began to realize there was something interesting going on here and clearly later activity. So we found crucible shards and molds that looked like the ones we were getting from Rhiney. We were finding multiple floor layers, multiple hearths. Um, and that's continued into uh, last year's work uh, and work we did during lockdown, uh, finding lots of Roman finds as well as late Roman finds. Uh, so this is, uh, for example, Neen Valley ware coming from southern England, uh, applied, painted um, Roman pottery, incredibly unusual this far north, but finding big chunks of this uh, in the floor layers. Uh, of, of the houses uh, from Tappanoth. Um, and our work last summer with our undergraduate students uh, showing, again, multiple floor layers and multiple hearths within these buildings, um, very much like the kind of archaeology we were finding at Dunakair on the coast, uh, with multiple buildings built on top of one another, stacked hearths up to five or six hearths um, placed on top of one another, showing very intensive um, occupation uh, of these hill platforms. So it's, it's not something that, you know, people have uh, built overnight and, you know, occupied for a day or two. These are quite substantial dwellings uh, um, at this site. Uh, and last summer, we had some more nice finds, what looks like Roman glass, um, uh, beads, um, and again, uh, pottery, including native pottery. So they're making pottery, uh, which is something we know very little about. We've found some shards of native pottery now at Rhiney, uh, Mither Tap, Dunnacare, uh, and now from Tappanoth, showing there was um, uh, a Pictish or an a late Roman uh, native tradition of making uh, hand-built pots, which is an exciting find in itself. So... Um, this is what we think the site might have looked like at its height. Um, so the hundreds of house platforms um, and the dates we're beginning to get from here show contemporary occupation on, on uh, most of the ones we've dug uh, so far. And the dates extending from, again, the late Roman period, uh, 3rd century uh, AD, through to the 6th century. So um, again, we've got this kind of late Roman emergence of this major, major settlement uh, and it going through unbroken sequence into the 5th and 6th centuries uh, AD. So again, we've got that real evidence for continuity uh, across that kind of traditional divide. So what on earth is going on here? You know, now we, we've, we've got not only Rhiney in the valley, we've got Tappanoth, uh, up um, overlooking it, the huge settlement. And we also have a, a ring fort at Care Moor, which also seems to be uh, broadly contemporary. So we've got multiple nodes within this landscape. So it's not just a single power center in this landscape. We've clearly got lots of different elements. And it's kind of like what you find in Scandinavia in, in the kind of pre-Viking age uh, and Viking age. Uh, where you've got these uh, um, so-called kind of multifunctional central place complexes where you've got lots of different power nodes within uh, these, these landscapes. And if we look at the chronology um, of uh, the Strathbogie Valley in that first millennium AD context, uh, you can see that the earliest element of that is tapping off. And that seems to be the key to the site, really. You've got this uh, emerging major settlements dating back to the to, to the third century. <laughs> and that may be being the foundations for uh, a hierarchy to develop and this kind of lowland royal complex to develop in that late fourth century, certainly fifth century uh, context. Um, and these three sites kind of operating together at their height in the fifth and sixth century uh, and care more being the kind of last element of that going through to the seventh century AD uh, context. So we've got this incredible wealth now of evidence from, from that valley, which is really exciting to try and get our heads around um, and answers and postcards as to what it all means. <laughs> That's for the monograph. 
Right, so that's a kind of review and a bit of an update on, on Rhiney. Um, this is a bit more hot off the press uh, from Burkhead about what we've been up to there uh, last summer. So again, we were working here um, last summer with our undergraduate students and, and volunteers. Um, and this is a promontory fort, um, which was the biggest picture site known until uh, that pesky tapping off claim claimed the uh, claimed the trophy. Uh, so here you got the big promontory for half of it under underlying um, the modern village at Rainy uh, at Barquette even, uh, and this place uh, partly destroyed in the nineteenth century uh, with the landward defences thrown into the into their ditches and lots of finds recorded from there, many coins, battle axes, and spearheads. Uh, and judging by the amount of finds we found in, in kind of disturbed contexts, um, then I can believe these accounts. There clearly is a huge amount of material culture from Burkhead. It's the most iron-rich site that I've worked on uh, in this uh, uh, part of the world. Um, as part of that destruction, there were some other great discoveries, uh, including the bull carvings, up to 30 of these, but only six uh, surviving today, unfortunately. Um, but also evidence for later occupation of the site going into the early Christian period, uh, probably the 8th and 9th centuries AD, judging by the, the art historical um, styles and parallels. So we've got uh, fragments of cross slabs, um, a box shrine, uh, showing that there was clearly some sort of uh, important church or, or chapel at Burkhead, uh, which is unusual in its own, own, own right. Um, and then in uh, 2015, we began working here, not with a lot of hope. People were saying, and, and we were thinking that, you know, it was a pretty trash site. There was not going to be much surviving. Um, but lo and behold, under a bit of a meter of overburden, you've actually got excellent preservation at Burkhead, essentially because it's a big sand dune. Um, and over a thousand years, you've had a, bit, a build up of a meter of sand in places or more overlying uh, the early medieval archaeology. So this is the um, end of an 8th, 9th century building that we found uh, in 2015 to 17. Uh, this is one where we had coins of King Alfred, uh, the famous 9th century uh, English king. Um, and again, evidence for the uh, production of weaponry. This is quite a ropey uh, uh, sword hilt. So probably destined to go back to the to the blacksmith for reworking. Um, and what we're doing at the moment, uh, we're in the second year, or this will be our third year coming up this summer, uh, of a Historic Environment Scotland funded project, which is looking at uh, uh, the fort in uh, advance of coastal erosion. So you can see quite serious coastal erosion happening um, at the uh, upper citadel end, end of the fort here. Um, and what we found is that the uh, upper citadel rampart at the seaward end uh, has largely been destroyed. The outer wall face is completely gone in most places. Uh, and the inner wall face, which is incredibly well preserved, is only about half a metre uh, and indeed in some places lost to erosion. So that, the idea is to essentially excavate this whole area between the Coast Guard station houses here uh, and um, the sea. Uh, and uh, record that archaeology before it's lost uh, to erosion. Uh, and that's a big challenge. Um, it's a bit like a civil engineering project, this. Uh, it's a big sand dune, as I say, so it's very hard to keep good uh, edges to the archaeology. Um, it's like the Sahara Desert. You'll come back and find your um, area that has been nicely traveled, covered in sand again. Um, and also the depth of deposits is, is really quite something. So at this, the seaward end, the rampart was actually built down slope and part of it landscaped up in order to create more of a le level area. So the foundation of the wall is sometimes three and a half, four meters deep uh, and incredibly dangerous. So we have to get uh, this very elaborate shoring built. As we go down, we shore and basically um, uh, can only reveal parts of the wall face as we go down. So on the left-hand side here, you can see our excavators working at the top of the wall face here. 
<laughs> on the right hand side, you can see uh, James O'Driscoll uh, standing towards the base of the wall, uh, and you see the height at which that survives. Um, and you can also see, um, well, you can't see so much here, but uh, on the right hand side, you might just see the kind of burnt beams. So that the fort seems to be, or part of the fort seems to be destroyed by fire. And in those destruction deposits, um, we found this year a stoneworking chisel, uh, which is incredibly uh, rare. I think there's the um, chisel from Port Mahomet being the only other Pictish example that we know of. Uh, and this is a huge chisel. It's for um, stoneworking. And all the, uh, or many of the stones in the wall face of the rampart are actually hammer dressed. Uh, and so we can see the actual tools they were using uh, here. And then this is the rampart wall face itself. You can see the burnt beams again in the top left here. And this is a schematic drawing in the bottom right showing horizontal timbers in the wall face. Uh, the upper, of course, is burnt. And then the blue uh, symbols are the transverse beams going into the core of the rampart. So it's probably the best preserved timber laced rampart we have from uh, uh, Britain and Ireland. Uh, and inside the fort, um, as I say, there's destruction deposits, there's uh, settlement, uh, and we're getting some quite uh, remarkable finds from this. So this is um, a bell, a hand bell or an animal bell um, that came from an area of uh, destruction deposits just inside the rampart. Uh, it's one of only about 20 known from Scotland, and I think the last time one was found in excavation was in the 1930s, uh, the Barocca Bursi. So incredibly rare. Um, and you can see it's got its um, clapper still intact, uh, its handle near the top of the bell. Uh, and these are composite iron and copper alloy bells. They're kind of the height of metalworking technology uh, in this time period. And usually associated with ecclesiastical sites. Uh, but here we had big, bits of sheet metal uh, found near this. So they might actually be making bells uh, at Burkhead. So pretty advanced blacksmithing going on. Uh, and then this year, we found more weaponry. So the spearhead uh, coming from an area of metalworking. These are two metalworking hearths uh, in the upper citadel. Uh, and then down in the lower citadel, this area is not nearly under the same threat. Uh, but we're doing kind of stripping map, map exercises here to compare what's going on in the lower citadel to what's going on in the upper citadel. Uh, and there's quite clear differences in terms of the types of activities, the types of deposits you're finding uh, in both locations. So down in the lower citadel, it's essentially, it's a huge mass of rubbish here. There are huge um, animal bone uh, deposits uh, and lots and lots of buildings. Uh, in amongst this morass. Um, and here, the preservation is, is, is amazing because of that amount of bone. Sheer number of, of bone deposits has led to good preservation of animal bone, which we don't get in Pickland in general. Um, and here you can see there's, there's hearths from buildings um, and lots of animal bone associated with that, fish bone, uh, shellfish. Uh, and large sub-rectangular buildings, multiple phases to these. Uh, you can see earlier buildings here, buildings in the top right here. And essentially, as we get closer to the rampart, um, there's more collapse overlying these deposits and the preservation gets better and better. So hopefully next year will be even better preservation than we had this year. Um, and because of that kind of alkaline conditions created by all the animal bone, we were getting lovely bone objects things like fragments of combs, uh, pendants, uh, and pins, things like these bramble-headed and um, nail-headed uh, uh, pins. So, <clears throat> excuse me, um, what can we tell from this? Well, we can see that, you know, Burkhead was an incredibly densely occupied site. Essentially, wherever we've sunk trenches, uh, we found buildings, we found animal bone deposits, um, and because of that, we're going to be able to, I think, build up uh, a fantastic picture of the kind of animal economy of Burkhead. Uh, so Kate, I don't know if she talked about this, but um, 
uh, clear evidence for the movement of cattle to Burghead, perhaps as part of tribute. Uh, and we also have human remains from Burghead that were able to do some uh, isotopic work looking at diet and mobility of those uh, remains. Um, and then clearly, again, like Rhiney, you got kind of spiritual dimension to power at the site. Uh, so we've got the Burghead bulls, and this this chap here on the right turned up uh, uh, last year. Um, it was recorded in the 1970s, but disappeared. And uh, <laughs> very strange carved head, very similar to the kind of Iron Age through to early medieval um, uh, so-called pagan uh, uh, depictions of, of heads or severed heads or uh, skulls that you get from uh, certain sites. Uh, and then that continues into the later period with the quite unusual evidence for a church actually within a fort. Uh, so looks like towards the entranceway uh, of the fort, there was a chapel site uh, at Burkhead. So that's some of the exciting developments from Burghead. Uh, I could have told you about other sites as well, but I'm going to run out of time. Uh, so you might have heard we found a new picture stone at Aberlemno. Uh, I'm not going to say anything about that, other than that's really cool. <laughs> so you'll have to invite me back in all time to uh, talk about this. Uh, but not only do we have a picture stone at Aberlemno, but it looks like we've got uh, in situ picture deposits and a palisaded enclosure. Uh, and other elements that go from the kind of late pictish period through to the 11th, 12th centuries uh, AD. Um, but I just thought I'd end uh, in the last five minutes uh, by looking at uh, the picture symbols. And again, you can read more about this in the book. Uh, I've got some new information there as well. Um, so the kind of classic view of the pics is, is, uh, has been very much focused uh, on uh, the symbols. Um, so these are found on metalwork and on carved stone monuments. Uh, and the study of this goes back at least to the uh, uh, mid 19th century, uh, with John Stewart, an Aberdeenshire lad, uh, who was the first one, I think, really to explicitly link the stones to, to the picks, uh, particularly in his second volume uh, the sculpt of the Sculpture Stones uh, of Scotland. Uh, so here linking uh, the distribution of stones, i.e. north of the Forth uh, and up to the Northern Isles and to the Western Isles uh, with picks. Um, but kind of scratching around uh, uh, archaeologists did in terms of dating. So only real way of dating them was to link them to manuscript sources uh, suggesting a date of the 8th and 9th centuries uh, AD. And similarly, Alan and Anderson uh, in 1903, uh, also struggling with uh, chronology um, and coming up with this uh, typological system, which we still use today, the class one and the class two uh, systems. Um, but um, again, kind of not being quite tentative, I think, in terms of actually ascribing dates to these monuments. So broadly, 7th, 8th century, they suggested and throughout the history of scholarship, you can see that people have been plumping for dates without much evidence. So sometimes 5th century, sometimes 6th, 7th century, uh, a very few people suggesting a kind of late Roman Iron Age uh, origins. But generally, 6th, 7th centuries was the kind of um, uh, time period that people uh, concentrated on. Um, and I'd say the only way of doing this was through art historical methods. And my first degree was in art history, and this is where I got interested in the pics. Uh, and this was fascinating to try and link the kind of art artistic representations you saw in the stones with things like manuscript sources. Um, and that was, again, suggesting a relatively late date. Um, what we can also tell from the kind of symbolism is that link between people and symbols um, as some sort of identity marker. So you can see, for example, a Dunfalandi, the pairing of symbols next to people. Um, but it was really only in the 2010 um, uh, that uh, the kind of scientific dating began to become uh, a possibility or uh, a realization that you could actually uh, adopt more archeological methods to the dating. So the National Museum of Scotland dating the Brock of Burian Oxbone to the late 6th to early 7th century. 
Um, and then our work uh, uh, also revisited some of these uh, Northern Isles excavations where you get better bone preservation um, and dating uh, an ox bone from pool uh, and by association a pin as well uh, with, with these symbols to the fifth and sixth centuries. Um, so pulling back the chronology, the absolute chronology into that uh, you know, immediate post-Roman period. Uh, but then our work at Danakir, which I've talked about before, um, possibly suggesting or earlier origins into the late Roman Iron Age. Uh, and also evidence from uh, Gurness, which you can read about in the book, also suggests maybe again a kind of late Roman uh, Iron Age uh, um, origin for this uh, symbol tradition. So the evidence of Danakir is that the, the stones seem to have come from the rampart and we've dated the rampart to the late third, early fourth century uh, AD. And then from that, we were able to develop this typology with the earlier symbols showing really quite uh, an economy of line and very little internal decoration to the symbols as you see at Rhiney. And it's really only in the seventh century that you begin to get clearer links with the kind of manuscript art in terms of internal decoration, uh, and at the height, um, you find monuments like Rose Markey uh, or the Tarbert Peninsula monuments that are straight out the pages of an illuminate, illuminated manuscript. So you can see there's an incredibly long tradition going from at least the 5th century, probably the 3rd, 4th centuries into that uh, time period. So again, I think like the forts, like the settlements, um, it seems highly likely that we're getting, a, again, a tradition emerging in that uh, Roman world with contact with a literate culture to the south. Uh, and that's been a continuous tradition from that time period through into the early medieval period until at least the 8th century uh, AD. And in terms of function, we're also beginning to pin that down more, I think, in terms of field archaeology. So we can now uh, see through work at uh, places like Dunrobin or Garbeg that these are occasionally found in funerary contexts, uh, perhaps given the name or identity of that person and death, but they're also found at settlement sites. So we can see at Rhiney, at Dunacair, at Burghead, an association with the entrance ways or the defences of these major forts and defended settlements. So almost like a you know a big signpost as you go into these settlements that tell you who's boss, who's who's in charge um, here. But also these symbols found on metalwork as well. So again, a, a link to personal identity. Um, so no one function really describing uh, these stones. So to kind of conclude, you know what what can we say um, <laughs> about the Picts and about Pictish archaeology? Well, we can see that these fortified centres are developing in that late Roman Iron Age uh, context. Um, and they go on and reach their height in that immediate post-Roman context in the fifth, sixth centuries AD uh, uh, context. But they go right through into the Viking Age, uh, shown by Burghead, uh, and maybe even beyond into the 11th uh, century and even 12th century, perhaps. Uh, and we can see that power um, and uh, elite identity was very much um, materialized through these, these major forts. Uh, they were major uh, settlements, as shown by Burkhead, densely uh, occupied. And we can also see from Rhiney that these were incredibly uh, complex, way more complex than we've given credit to for this period. So we've always seen Pictish power centers as being really small, uh, you know, less than a hectare. But now the evidence from Tapnoth suggests that the, the kind of social organization in that late Roman uh, and early pictures period is way beyond what we've we've given credit to. And we're clearly dealing with a much more complex society um, than, than, than uh, given credence. And we can also hopefully see that pics can uh, begin to take more of a central stage position uh, in early medieval studies. So thank you very much for listening. And uh, did I tell you that we had a, a book out? <laughs>